Good day and welcome to Behind the Story. I'm Ricardo De Silva, Associate Editor at America Media. We're days away from a historic papal trip, the first ever visit of any pope to Iraq, a country that Pope Francis has described as a martyred land. From March 5th to 8th, Pope Francis will visit the majority Muslim country that is also home to about 400,000 Christians, about 1% of that country's total population. But what can we expect from this four-day trip that some are calling the papal visit of the century and the defining stop of Pope Francis's papacy? What distinguishes this trip from the Pope's previous travels around the world? You can follow America Media's coverage of the Pope's trip to Iraq on an especially dedicated section of the America Magazine website. Visit americamagazine.org slash Iraq 2021. Joining me today from Rome to tease out the details and significance of the Pope's upcoming visit is Father Christopher Clohesi, a Catholic priest from South Africa and a leading scholar in Shi Islam and Christian Muslim dialogue teaching at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies. Chris, welcome to Behind the Story. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's, it's really good to be here. It's good to be with you. Um, the last time we met, uh, we were both in South Africa. So now in New York and uh, you in Rome, it's really good to see you again. Well, well, I hope we have a good session. I'm sure we will. So, Chris, this is a long-awaited papal trip. Uh, Pope John Paul II had planned to travel to Iraq. Pope Benedict XVI was also invited to visit Iraq, but security concerns at the time prevented his visit. Pope Francis has himself been planning to travel there for some time, but plans have often been scuppered. Now, in the middle of a pandemic and a nationwide lockdown in Iraq scheduled to end just after the Pope visits, we're told that the lockdown will be temporarily lifted to accommodate the Pope's visit. Why is the Pope's visit so urgent now? It is something of a, a double-edged sword, this visit. And certainly John Paul wanted to go to Iraq, possibly for different reasons to Pope Francis. He certainly wanted to go to the origins of monotheism, the origins of Abraham, whereas Francis has a different uh, agenda. But it's a double-edged sword because, on the one hand, there are great worries about COVID. The reason the country is in lockdown is presumably because it needs to be in lockdown. And to lift the lockdown for a, a foreign trip, even one as important as this, is a little nerve-wracking. It also means that people will not be able to gather in great numbers, which I suspect will be frustrating not only for the Christians, but also for the ordinary Iraqi Muslim who would like very much to see Pope Francis. He's a popular world figure. So the COVID thing is already an issue and the lifting of the lockdown temporarily is, is in itself a little threatening. Secondly, you have the constant threat of violence. That's always been an issue of various radical groups who may see this as an opportunity to get themselves back into the media and onto the world stage. On the other hand, you have a country that is in desperate need of, for want of a better word, a catalyst, something that's going to propel it forward out of a, something of a political and even religious rut. It's come through the most horrendous civil strife. It's not that it's been at war with some other country, it's been at war with itself. Uh, and, and the damage that has been done to the national psyche, the Iraqi psyche, to to faith in that country, to citizenship in that country, is beyond telling. And therefore, despite the obvious threats and dangers, I suspect that on many levels this visit is going to bring a certain a substantial amount of healing, not only to the Christians, but also to ordinary faithful Muslims who need something, some sign that Iraq is not forgotten, that it's not a backward nation, that the people who live there are as important as any other people. I think Francis is saying this loud and clear, not only to them, but to the whole world. And we'll get to the people who live there. I want to, you know, really drill down into that and find out more about who's there. But should we be worried about the Pope's safety? 
I've been trying to find out who's going to take responsibility, and it's always hard to find out because people don't talk about these things. I know that the Iraqis themselves would be absolutely insistent that they will care for security arrangements. But you know better than I do that a papal visit is a massive thing, and the security is not only hugely difficult to organize, but it's massively expensive as well. Therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if quietly they get some help from benevolent nations, and I would hope that they will do that, because I think it's going to be a massive challenge to a country that is scarcely able at this moment to prevent moments of civil strife. There was a, a rocket attack just recently in Baghdad. It's already a country struggling with security to protect its own people. The Pope, as a foreign visitor, is going to be, in some sense, exposed. He's not going to be kept in a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a safe environment perpetually. There are going to be moments where he's going to be exposed in public, and these are going to be slightly worrying, yes. So, I mean, maybe we need to <clears throat> dial back a bit and go into history. Can you take us through the last, I mean, three decades? What's it been like for Iraqis in general? It has been... And I can, I can only say this not from personal experience, but from talking to Iraqis and knowing Iraqis. It has been something of a mixed bag. For one thing, there was a great hope, at least at the beginning, that this was the beginning of something new. That a persecuted, the persecuted groups, including the majority Shia group, who were certainly persecuted under the, the, the Ba'ath regime, under the Saddam Saddam Hussein regime, that these persecuted groups were finally going to find their feet, that eventually foreign troops would leave and the country would stabilize. That hasn't quite happened, and we'll come to him, of course, but Sistani has played a massive role in attempting to forge some sort of peace. So what you have is an already battered nation that's fast lost hope, those beginnings uh, with the fall, fast lost hope because of the constant internal strife, the rise of ISIS, the extraordinary damage done by that group, the Muslim against Muslim violence, which, which is always for the Islamic community a terrible thing, the draining away of the Christian community, which has gotten smaller and smaller as Christians have left, and economic, great economic strife and poverty. So these have not been happy years, and it's for this reason that I think that the Iraqis need somebody to tell them they're important, that their country is great and can be great, and that they're not, they're not forgotten, that they're not regarded as some backward Arab state. They are much more important, considering their history, considering the history of civilization, they are very, very important for us. And I think this is the message that they need to hear. Who who are who are these battered people? You know who who is this battered nation that uh, Pope Francis is going to visit in just a few days? It's a uh, an interesting mix. The, it's a majority Shia country. Shia are probably about fifty five, maybe sixty percent. It's always hard to get exact statistics, but they are certainly the majority Muslim group. Despite the fact that Saddam Hussein was a Sunni Muslim, and because of his huge distrust of Iran and Iranian Shia um, dealings and politics, the, the Shia in Iraq were persecuted. They were certainly ill-treated. They were not given the full rights that they that that would be should be theirs as citizens. So you have the Shia, you have the Kurds, who are mostly Sunni, but who have always been persecuted in Iraq. And the Kurds, uh, I think, are probably more in the north than, than down south. But the Kurds have been herded together almost in their own zone and have never had an easy time. You have the Yazidi. The, the Yazidi are hard to define because some people think, still think that they are idol worshippers or the, the famous dictionary of Arabic language by Hans Ver uh, still defines them as as devil worshippers. Well, this is not who the Yazidi are at all. They're somewhat secretive, and it's difficult to know who they are, but they have been heavily damaged by ISIS. And then, of course, you have the, the, the Sunni and the strife between the Shia and the Sunni. The Christians, as you said, somewhere between 300 to 500,000, mixture of Chaldeans, Assyrians, uh, Catholics, um, non-Catholic uh, Christians, Lutherans and Anglicans, but also um, non-Catholic Orthodox groups, Syrian, Syrian Christians. So they're an, an interesting mix of Christians, but I suspect that in this moment they're going to be somewhat united by, by the papal visit. So Chris, th these Christians that you've just told us about, 
Why is Pope Francis going to speak to them? In his own words, or at least in the words, I think, of Cardinal Sandri, he's going to comfort and console them. Um, that is to, uh, to let them know that they are not forgotten, despite the fact that they really are a tiny minority in a massive Muslim majority, to let them know that they are part of the universal body of Christ, that they belong to a much wider group, to let them know that they are that they are important, that he is their shepherd as much as he may be the shepherd of any other group. So he's, he used the word comfort and console, not only them, also the other citizens of the country, Christian and non-Christian alike, but quite patently as a shepherd and a pastor, his visit to them is of supreme importance to them in that role as one who speaks a word of comfort and consolation and speaks a word of hope and Francis is a man who's known for these things, peace and hope and comfort. And so just his presence there is going to be, for them, I think, an extraordinary moment. I, th I think he's put it in very strong language. You know, he's, he's basically said he has a moral obligation to the people of Iraq. Where does that moral obligation stem from, do you think? Probably from a number of places. It could be from his... His visit last uh, two years ago, his, his, the time he spent with the, 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 the Sunni leader Tayeb as her mosque, the, the time that they signed together this document on human fraternity, it could be that he now needs to carry this message to countries where, where the elements of that document need to, to be reinforced and to be heard strongly, elements about you know, rights and dignity and freedom. So it could be that. In terms of, of the Christians themselves, it could be that. But it could also be that he needs to go to a country that has been in the news for the last, what, 30 years with nothing good, always bad news, always news of violence and destruction, always news of hopes being dashed, and that possibly his role as a peacemaker can, can make a difference there. But there are other reasons too. Obviously, he needs, to, he needs to visit a country where the Shia are in ma a majority, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, and where he can address them as much as he has addressed the Sunni world. So I think he's coming from a whole lot of angles, and he certainly has made it clear he's going for the whole population, not just for one or other particular group. But, but there is a focus uh, I mean, to, to his visits and, and to what he's been saying. Um, there is a Muslim focus here. I mean, it's, it's clear that he is going to console Christians, but there is clearly a bridge he's going to build for Muslims. And, you know, we've been talking about Sunni and Shia. I'm not sure that our audience all know um, who the Sunni and the Shia are. And could you say something about that? You know, who, who are they? Um, and, and how do they fit into Islam? Because Islam is not a monolith. It's a, it's a complex history, and it's a both political and theological history, and it concerns primarily the moments immediately after the death of the Prophet Muhammad and the question of whether he had left behind any details about successorship, that is, not successor as prophet, but as leader of this nascent community, Islamic community. And while the majority seemed to think that any good Muslim could take over from him, a smaller group who were primarily members of his own family, led by Ali, who was his cousin and his son-in-law, felt that the leadership should stay in the family and therefore in the bloodline. And various political maneuverings took place immediately after the death of the Prophet. And Depending on whether you're reading the Shia version or the Sunni version of history, you will read it differently. But the Shia are the smaller group who insist and continue to insist that Ali should have been the next leader after Muhammad and after Ali, his own sons, etc., etc. So that, in a sense, in their hearts or in their minds, the Shia have kept a running tally of those who ought to have been the leader of the House of Islam and have not been that. Now, it's a hotly debated question, but quite clearly, the, the Shia, who form maybe 10 or 12 percent of the Islamic world, appear to be a majority, but in terms of numbers, they represent a substantial number of people. In India alone, there are millions and millions of Shia Muslims. So we're not talking about a tiny, fragmented group. We're talking about 
a major part of the Islamic family. Um, and, and, and quite clearly, the Pope has understood this. Somebody has told him this because he seems to me to be embracing the other part of the family with an embrace that began not two years ago, certainly when he visited with um, uh, Said al Tayyib, but, but, or Sheikh al Tayyib, but back in Vatican II days, already when the church was beginning to reach out, that's when the embrace began. It seems to have come, becoming now full circle, and that's why it's such an important visit. So the Shia are dominant in Iran. They're also a majority in Bahrain, a majority in Iraq. The point being that the Shia, for all their minority status, sit on some of the most geopolitically strategic parts of the world, where there's lots of oil, and therefore they are a very important factor and component in world politics as it plays out. So is, is that why Pope Francis is going there? I mean, is, is that the focus or his focus on Shi Islam um, to speak political? <laughs> or, or, you know, does it go deeper than that? I'm not sure if he wants to speak political. I think he wants to complete the embrace. He has, he has met the, rep the representative of the Sunni world, but he knows that the Shia community does not follow Al-Azhar and does not follow the Sunni leadership. And so now he is, he is embracing the Shia family. And it's a good embrace because we have had a long and, and, and healthy dialogue with Shia Islam, the Catholic Church. They are not strangers to us. And this, in a sense, signs and seals those years of, of relationship between Tehran and Rome, and London, and other places where this Shia Catholic dialogue has taken place. So primarily, his, his address to the Muslims is not not political in terms of the Sunni-Shia divide. There's nothing he can do about that. It's simply embracing the other part of the family. So one of those important stops he's making, right, is he's going to Najaf, uh, where he's going to meet privately behind closed doors, we're told, um, probably no cameras, the Grand Ayatollah, um, Sayyid Ali al-Husseini al-Sistani. Um, who, who is um, the Grand Ayatollah? You know, why is Pope Francis meeting him? Look, the truth about Sistani, and I don't say this because I study Shia, but because it's true, is that he is an extraordinary human being. And you only have to look at his CV to see the awards he's been given, the Nobel Prize he's been nominated for, to see that his name occurs over and over again in the list of the most prominent Muslims. He's an Iranian born um, and studied in Qum, um, but completed his studies in Najaf, so you have these two schools, Najaf and Qum, and you have to think of them in terms of Oxford and Cambridge, really. It's two centers of learning rather than two single institutions, each with its own particular trend. And he's got a foot in both because he's Iranian-born and he studied there and then in Najaf. As the leader of the Najaf seminary or the Najaf Hausa, as it's called, he has under his authority huge numbers of Shia scholars, important Shia scholars, spread throughout the world. And therefore his, his influence on the Islamic Shia world is phenomenal. But even if it wasn't, he is profoundly respected in the Shia and the Sunni world as a peacemaker, as a man who's understood the need to put an end to radicalism and violence. And therefore I say without fear of contradiction, and I've said it often on camera, that with Francis and Sistani you are dealing with two men with the same mindset. You are dealing with two men who both have come to understand, both of whom have come to understand that it's absolutely crucial that we find a peace that comes through justice. They both know that equally well. So it's it's, it's two men who are on exactly the same level. Uh, and he's, he's chosen the right representative to meet. It is a dramatically good move on the Pope, Pope's part. Have they spoken before? I mean, do we know? Has, has there been some dialogue between them? Not that I know of. Sistani is camera shy. He's a frail, elderly man. He rarely appears in public. Um, and there certainly has been a long, healthy, ongoing dialogue between Rome and Tehran in terms of Shia and Catholic scholars, and also England, because that, that trinity, if you like, of places has long been involved in Shia-Catholic dialogue. Not, I'm not entirely sure whether Sistani has ever been involved. I doubt it. But I, I'm not even sure whether interreligious dialogue would be at the top 
of Sistani's list of priorities. He's got far more important things to worry about, and that is to build the bridges between Sunni and Shia factions in Iraq, and that has occupied all of his time. So there's been talk of that, right? There's been talk that um, Pope Francis is some kind of benevolent mediator for the Shia and Sunni worlds. What do you think of that as an expert in Islam? How do you understand that? No, I, I, I doubt it very much. The, 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 the problem, first of all, is way out of the ambit of the Catholic Church and the leadership of the Catholic Church. And it's a, a problem that goes back 14 whatever years, 1400 years of history. No, I, I suspect that if anything, Francis can be a bridge between Iraqi Shia and Iraqi Sunni, primarily because they are Iraqi, not because they are Sunni or Shia, and may find themselves in different political camps. But in terms of the Shia-Sunni divide, no, Pope Francis, I think, will have no, no particular role to play in that. It's a, it's a problem that's way beyond the competence of anybody except for Muslims themselves. So, I mean, you know, you've mentioned this document on human fraternity. Um, some have said that in Pope Francis' behind-closed-doors visit with um, al-Sistani, there is hope, uh, or at least suspicion, that he might sign up to that document on human fraternity, which called for an end to extremism. And another idea, which maybe we can get onto, but about Pope Francis' uh, culture of encounter, calling for a culture of encounter. Do you think there's any likelihood of that? I'm not convinced that Sistani is going to sign anything. It's a short meeting, and I don't think there's going to be... I might be pleasantly mistaken, but I mean, I'd be happy if there was something. But I suspect that if there's any document, it'll be issued afterwards. Sistani is a, a wise old scholar, and he's not just going to sign something because it would be a good idea. I think that he would be careful about that. Um, so, so I suspect that whatever they'll say will be... Will be perhaps reflected in some documentation afterwards, and really that it's the symbolic gesture of the meeting more than what they say in such a short time that's going to make the difference. So I have my doubts whether the... I think that Francis is acting upon elements of the human fraternity document by this very visit, but I'm not sure if that's going to become the, the subtext of the visit. I think that there are other issues that go beyond the document for human fraternity that he's going to have to deal with. So if you were counselling Pope Francis, and I know you're not, but if you were to be counselling Pope Francis ahead of this visit, what would you be saying to him about visiting um, Iraq and specifically meeting al-Sistani? Firstly, I would say well done, because it's a brave move. He's going to a dangerous situation. I'm sure he's going to meet criticism from various people. And he seems, from, from what I, I gather, he seems absolutely pig-headed, forgive the phrase, about this. He is determined that he's going to go, and that's a marvelous thing for me, that nothing will put him or deter him. For me, that's a real Christian pastor. So I would say, well done. I would say to him, primarily, you need to, you need to speak to the Christians. Of course you do. You need to tell them how loved they are, how important they are as members of the body of Christ. But you need to speak for them as well. And that's a different thing and a more difficult conversation. The more difficult conversation that is fundamental to this visit is a conversation that others have had already. And, and it's the conversation about freedom of worship, about giving full rights of worship and freedom to minority groups, the Christian groups in particular. That conversation has to be had because nobody can deny that Christian minorities in the Islamic world are suffering. And, and this is two years after the document of human, on human fraternity, they are still suffering. The Pope, and I suspect he will, but I would say to him, please, Your Holiness, grab the bull by the horns and, and say it, because the Christians are waiting to hear it. One of the things that I know from experience, because I've heard them say it, one of the things that upsets the Christians in countries like Iran, Iraq, but other Muslim-majority countries, is that Christian delegates come and have interreligious dialogue, but they don't speak for the Christians there. And the Christians, they are the ones who matter. They are the ones we should be speaking for. They need a voice, and they need an international voice. And we've had a few people who've spoken of this 
of late, um, in, you know, heads of state and, and, and even, even members of the royal family who have spoken of the, to this issue. I think to have it spoken by Francis, to, for him to follow in the steps of someone like Cardinal Toran, who was not afraid to say these things, even in, in, in difficult situations, I would say to him, please speak to them, but also speak for them. Because the whole point of the document you signed two years ago is about freedom and dignity and fraternity. And those are sorely absent in a number of Christian minority communities. And that really appears to be at the center. I mean, Pope Francis has said himself, you know, the inalienable rights, uh, inalienable rights um, to religious freedom. Um, so this isn't a kind of there's no conversion effort here, um, as you know, some people might like to think, oh, there's, there's a conversion um, approach. It, it just doesn't, to my mind anyway, seem to compute with how we understand Christian-Muslim relations into religious dialogue. But I think it'd be good to express that clearly for our listeners. Yes, you know, we, we since Vatican II, this has been a somewhat polemical issue, mission or dialogue? Can you do both? Do you do one or the other? And I know that even in the council, while documents like Nostra Aetate were being discussed, it caused some infighting. And it is still a difficult subject to, to delineate. You know, do we concentrate on interreligious dialogue at the expense of calling people to the gospel? Or do we go the other route and forget about dialogue and evangelize? And I think that the last popes, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, Francis himself, have all got it right that, first of all, interreligious dialogue builds up a relationship. And then, once you have built up a relationship, you can call people to the gospel. You know, so, for example, I have great Muslim friends, genuine friends, with whom I am not afraid to discuss the gospel because they're not threatened by it and I'm not threatened by it because we've got a good relationship that has been built up over years. That relationship is part of evangelization. Benedict said that, John Paul said that. I think Francis probably has said the same thing, that interreligious dialogue forms an integral part of, di of mission and of evangelization. It, and it's not alien to, they are, they are integral to each other. So the Pope is going there to build relations and to build on foundations that already exist of relations. He's not going there to win converts to the Catholic faith because it's neither the time nor the place to do that. The relationship has to be built first. And it's a, a difficult relationship. The relationship between the West and the East is already difficult, i.e. between what is traditionally regarded as the Muslim East and the Christian West. It's already a difficult relationship because you have two distinct worldviews. It's taken years and years of painful, slow work to build the bridge as far as it is now. And I think the, the Pope is, is continuing to build that bridge. Talking about building that bridge, I mean, I, you know, I'm talking to you, uh, a Catholic priest, um, also an Islamic scholar in, in a very important institute um, of the Vatican. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, very personally, what is it about Islam that has attracted you and that you think holds something for us as Christians and perhaps specifically as Catholics? Well, I, you know, I can only speak personally to this question that I, as you know, was working as a priest in South Africa where the Muslims are a tiny minority, but they're a very visible and vocal minority. And I came to the understanding very quickly that in the parishes I was involved in, almost every Catholic family had at least one member who'd converted to Islam for a variety of reasons, quite often marriage, but that they couldn't simply be cut out they were still members of the family and therefore they were still members of my parish and the community who I loved and cared for. And I, I suggested years ago to the bishop that somebody should study Islam, but not me, because study was never something I really wanted to do much of. And I was perfectly happy where I was. But then the bishop met up by chance. Within a, a few months, he met Cardinal Arinze and the now Cardinal Fitzgerald. And they both said off the bat when are you going to send a South African to study Islam? So my, say, my fate was sealed. During my studies, which was general studies, I became, uh, I became enamored with Shia Islam because of the links between Shiism and Catholicism, which are very strong, and decided with the guidance of Cardinal Fitzgerald, who was then a lecturer where I am now in the Pontifical Institute, that I would follow a, a Shia course for my, my doctoral. And I've been teaching and researching Shia 
Islam ever since because they are strong echoes that resonate deeply in our spiritualities and our theologies. And dialogue is easy with the Shia community because there's just so much on which we agree. It, it really is this culture of encounter that you're, you know, that Pope Francis is speaking about and that you've sought, it seems, in your work. It is a culture of encounter and I, I genuinely believe the person we need to thank primarily is Pope Paul VI because Paul VI was the first one to use the word dialogue, really, to employ a, a, a secular term in a theological way. And he was the first modern pope to plunge into the Islamic world. He visited a number of places where there were substantial numbers of Muslims. Um, and, and so the encounter really begins in the texts of Vatican II, certainly, but actively they begin with Paul VI. And I I am convinced and I consistently argue the point that there's been a, a consistency since Paul VI right through to Francis of this encounter. It may have been expressed in a variety of languages or a variety of terms, but it's always been the church entering in to the encounter, not waiting for people to come to it, but going out to meet people where they are. And this was, of course, this was the whole point of the council, to open the windows a little and get out there. But Paul VI was the first to do it. And we've been doing it ever since. And the encounter is on a number of levels. And it's important to distinguish those levels. For the most part, I don't think it's a theological encounter. It's a human encounter between two people of faith or two communities of faith. You know, the truth is, we don't dialogue with Islam. We dialogue with Muslims, with people, not with an institution. And when Islam dialogues with us, they dialogue with individuals and with, you know, with people who are living faith. And therefore, the encounter is a human encounter between people who hold a faith that is common, the faith that came, began with Abraham, a monotheism. The, the theological encounter happens in colleges and universities and mosques and churches. But in ordinary situations, the far more widespread encounter is just between next door neighbors. The dialogue of life, it was once called. People living next door to each other and who have to find ways to, to live at peace together. Otherwise, they end up tearing each other apart. That's what the encounter is. And in Sistani and Francis, you have, and I'm sure the Pope would forgive me, two venerable old men who have long experience of lived faith between them coming to meet each other. It's, it's in a sense like Abraham going out in the heat of the day to meet with his visitors. And it's, it, it's got a ring of that and lots of other encounters in the scriptures. Mary going to visit Elizabeth, two women of faith meeting each other. It's a very good scriptural um, practice. And, and therefore, I think we're seeing God's word in action, in a sense. I mean, Pope Francis himself is making a visit. Um, and to follow that visit, uh, for our listeners, uh, for those watching us, you can follow American media's coverage to, uh, on the Pope's visit to Iraq at americamagazine.org slash Iraq 2021. One of the places you've just spoken about commonalities and, you know, you spoke about the birthplace of Abraham. Pope Francis will be going to Ur, um, which many say um, is the common birthplace of uh, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, um, the three great monotheistic traditions. What do you make of that encounter or, 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 or the, that stop um, on, on the trip? I think like the whole trip, it's, it's a, a microcosmic uh, version of the trip in that it's hugely symbolic, visiting the, the apparent, you know, the origins of Abraham. Now, now we have to be quite careful about Abraham because he's a bit of a hazy figure. We don't know that much about Abraham and, and some of his history is a little nerve-wracking. But what we can say is that, um, is that in Islam, he is not usually called the father in faith. That's not a term that Islam uses. But he is, he is, he is named by an Arabic word which means the upright monotheist. And he is the prime example of the upright man or the monotheist who believes in one God, uh, even if that monotheism is not as clearly defined as it could be. For Christians and Jews, he is a father figure, uh, in a sense that, that Islam doesn't use very, very much. But for all three religions, he is the symbol of monotheistic belief. Abraham is really the first 
person to be set on fire, if you like, with a yearning for the one God and to get up and go and search for him, which is what he did. I mean, he got up and he journeyed and, and his journey wasn't just a matter of being told to journey. His journey was because faith, whether it's Islamic or Christian or Jewish, faith is not primarily a creed we recite. Of course not. No, faith is an orientation. It's a way that people walk through life. The two men who are going to meet in Najaf are two men who have walked years by faith as Abraham did. So the Abrahamic stop is a very symbolic moment for Islam and for Christianity. You, you, you know, your talk about setting on fire um, reminds me of that great Islam, uh, not Islamic, but um, the great Jesuit phrase, go set the world on fire. Um, and so maybe like Abraham, Pope Francis is going to do this um, in, in, a, in a great way, in a very passionate way, in an engaged way. I wonder, you know, what do you think his Jesuit outlook is going to bring um, to this visit to Iraq? From the, the Iraqi point of view, I'm not sure anything because that's not how he's understood. He is understood, and I, I've said this before, that I think many Muslims understand him by his name because St. Francis is well known throughout the world, including the Islamic world. There's the famous story, and it's a debatable story, but it's the story of Francis going to meet the Sultan and having interreligious dialogue with him. It's the story with which uh, Pope Francis began his last encyclical, um, and therefore if you're a Muslim living in the Islamic world, Pope Francis is understood as Saint Francis would be understood, not primarily as, you know, as the, the Supreme Pontiff or the Vicar of Christ, not that at all. As the, as the, the leader of the Catholic Church, yes, but particularly as, as Francis, the peacemaker. And, and I, I saw one Muslim post that said, you know, the Pope of Najaf and the Pope of Rome are going to meet. And that does give an idea that there's not a complete understanding. I, I know little about Pope Francis' own outlook, but I, I think that he's, he's diplomatic. Maybe that's his Jesuit training. I don't know. You could tell me more than I could tell you that. But I think he's a genuinely diplomatic... Can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a diplomatic man. I think he has a gut feeling about things. He knows what to say and where to go. And he knows, in a way, as did, as did John Paul, he knows the gestures that are important. I remember John Paul stopping Mass one day, possibly in Damascus, for the call to prayer. Not because of any other reason except respect for the Islamic prayer. And it was an extraordinary gesture, and I know he was criticized by many people, but it was an extraordinary gesture of profound respect for the other. John Paul understood gestures, and I think Francis does too, and so just visiting Najaf, which is a holy city, of course, possibly the tomb of Ali as well, just talking to Sistani, who is so revered, just going to Iraq. All of these symbols, even if we never find out what was said, all of these symbols are profound and diplomatic. There is, there is a sense, I, I think, and I would like to hear from you, about this, the other, and the encounter with the other um, in Islam and, and how that is understood. So, I mean, primarily, of course, all modern popes have done this. They've gone out rather than received visitors. And it's been an extraordinary thing since the time of Paul's trips to places like Uganda and the Holy Land. The Pope has gone out, even, even yeah, no, Paul VI certainly, and from then onwards. So the, the idea of the pilgrim Pope, and there is in pilgrimage always an eschatological idea of coming to an end point, coming to the point, you know, where you need to be. So that's the one, the one side of it. The other side of it is in terms of the other, the whole reason why the institute in which I work exists is for that. It's for the church to be able on a particular level, both that is academic, that is trained and that is sensible, for want of a better word, to meet the other respectfully. Um, because that's always been the issue. That, that the meeting has been ended up, the meetings over the centuries have ended up as polemical debates or as, as angry, unresolved encounters. And the reason that our institute exists is because we think if encounter or dialogue or meeting the other is going to take place, it has to be informed. We have to be informed about our own belief and the belief of the other. And we are way ahead in this, in terms of doing this. We are hugely qualified now I mean, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the scholars who our institute has produced, including martyrs in Algeria, some of the recent martyrs, uh, you know, truly great scholars of Islam who have gone into 
places to meet the other. I, I, I call it the place of discomfort. And I heard that from a South African deacon, and I've never forgotten it, that, that we put ourselves deliberately into places that discomfort us primarily because they discomfort us. That's what incarnation is. Incarnation is the place of discomfort. It is the encounter where God comes to us instead of us desperately looking for God. And I think that we're looking here at an incarnational spirituality where the Pope, as a representative of a whole lot of things, makes himself visibly present to people who are in need. That's a really powerful way of putting it, you know, that Pope Francis is going out in search of God, God in, in, in the Christians there, God in the other minorities there. Uh, we haven't even spoken about the Yazidi, um, but also God in the Muslim will, world. Um, how does the Muslim world see that? You know, just from your experience, this, this visit by Pope Francis uh, to Iraq, how do Muslims in Iraq, how do you think um, it will be perceived, a pope, the Pope's visit? You've, you've spoken about St. Francis of Assisi, but th there must be more to that. Uh, well, again, a variety of levels. Firstly, your, your, your normal... Orthodox Islamic theology, like your normal Orthodox Catholic theology, insists that Christians, Jews, and Muslims worship one and the same God. This is not even worth debating anymore. This was something we were fighting over in the, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages. We don't need to talk about it. This is clearly stated by Vatican II, but it's also clearly stated by Islamic theology, that, that our God and their God is the same God. So, so they see the Pope primarily as a, a, a man who is a monotheist, a religious believer, and a man of faith, not a Muslim, a Christian, admittedly, but nonetheless a monotheist coming to visit them. I think that there has, for a long time, and I may be wrong, this is my own gut feeling, for a long time there has been a sense of inferiority in the Arab world. Arabs have always been looked down upon and, and treated as somewhat backward. This is by people who have no concept of what Islam was adding to our world when we were going through our dark ages in terms of science, mathematics, and just good old-fashioned things like food. We have people who have no idea of that, the contribution made by Islamic science, the contribution still made by Islamic scholars and saints. But there has been this sense of inferiority, and I think it was felt during the time of the Prophet, because as soon as Muhammad had died, Arabs began to spread into Byzantium, into Persia, and they weren't doing it to spread Islam primarily. They were doing it as a, as a, as a, a bit of Arab nationalism. They were, they were spreading their wings and you know, stretching their muscles a bit. But that sense of inferiority has been there, and I think the Pope's visit speaks to that and says, no, you're not inferior, you're not backward, you're not a forgotten, unnecessary state. It doesn't matter if you don't play a major role on the world stage at this moment. You are no less important than any other nation. I mean, just his presence there. Why there when he could go to so many other places? You know, the Pope has been to so many places and now Iraq. It's because he's adding them to the list of important places. This is my gut feeling. I mean, there are probably mm. deeper issues in his own mind. And I'm just thinking with a Western lens and perhaps especially coming to you, you know, from New York here, um, Islam has also been associated with terrorism, extremism. Um, so you going to, you know, not you, but rather Pope Francis, um, going to Iraq, dialoguing with, with the Muslim world, what, all that you've said about um, Islam being a religion of peace. Um, can we talk about that? Because I, I, I really do think there's, there's a strong misconception that the Pope is trying to break here as well. Look, the first thing is that Islam has never, ever claimed to be a pacifist religion. And, and that's very important. I don't think we have either particularly ever actually made that claim. The truth is there is in Islam, there are Muslims acting in the name of Islam who commit acts of violence. This is undeniable. But, but that could never be used to define Islam because you, 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 there's this constant danger of confusing principles and practices. What a faith teaches and what some members of the faith do are not the same thing. We would hate it if Catholicism was judged by bad, bad Catholics. That would be, and we would protest loudly against that, as does any good Muslim. So it is a stereotype, and it's a silly stereotype, to just presume that because some Muslims are violent, it must be a violent religion. It's just nonsensical. Um, nonetheless, Islamic violence that has been committed in the name of Islam 
has been a major issue in the news for, for decades now because violence always causes people to sit up and take notice. People who do violent things know that. That's why they do violent things, because it's going to get the attention of the world. It's, a, it's an irrational act, Benedict said. Violence is an irrational act, but people do an irrational act in order to gain attention or to get their message across, because they've learned people always take notice. And therefore, you know, it's not surprising that terrible acts of violence committed by people, sometimes, not always, claiming to be Muslim, again, because somebody's got an Islamic name doesn't necessarily mean he's acting in the name of Islam. That's a reality we have to live with. But you also are living with millions and millions of Muslims who live peaceful, faithful, prayerful lives every day and who are horrified by these acts, but, but could hardly be expected to stop them. You know, you could hardly say to a Muslim, why don't you speak out? Because that's just senseless. That doesn't make any difference to anybody. So it's a much more profound problem than that. And we have our own painful history. I mean, you know, Christianity itself um, has persecuted. So it's, it's, not as, it's not as though we're clean of um, being a, a religion that persecutes as well. So Absolutely. That, that's certainly part of our history. And I think it's important to say that. And, and, and perhaps it's one of the reasons we can talk to Islam. We can say to them, look, we've, we've been through this. We struggled through the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment in many ways did a great deal of damage to people's concept of faith and we had to redefine our terms and it was very painful, but we did it. Um, and we came to the understanding of the use of reason, for example, and to the use of theological terminology that was better than what we had. Therefore, we could speak as an older brother to Islam and say, look, we've also been through our periods of violence and darkness. So we, 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 we're with you. We understand this. And it, it's a very good point never to forget these things. We're not superior. Words are very easily lost in translation. I mean, Pope Francis knows that. Um, and he's a man of words, right? He, he's, he's a man that his, his words carry. Um, we've seen this throughout his papacy. What do you think are the key words uh, that we should look out for in the, on this trip, if you were to, again, <laughs> advise the Pope? Um, towards the Christians, the key words would have to do with, with, with consolation, with a shepherd coming to console his people, his flock that is perhaps a little scattered and has been damaged by the, you know, the storms of winter and now needs to be gathered to the breast, so to speak. In terms of his speaking to the Iraqi government, I would want to hear the word freedom and rights, those two words repeated over and over and over again, the basic, in their most basic understanding. Um, in terms of his talk to Sistani, I, I wouldn't know what to hear, to, to listen for, to expect, because again, I think you've got two men, both of whom are on an exceptionally high spiritual plane, after years of faithful service and faithful living and faithful prayer. And so whatever passes between them, I think will be good, even if we never discover what it, what it is. It's again the symbolic vision of that meeting that's going to count. And let's end off by talking about the words on your heart. You know, what are the words that you're thinking of? Uh, what hope do you have for this trip? I have a number of hopes. Obviously, I hope it will continue to strengthen Shia, let's say Shia Catholic dialogue to begin with, because that's, that's my field and it's quite a strong field. And I think that the Pope is going to cement all kinds of initiatives that have been taken quietly over years between Tehran and Rome and a number of other places. I think this is going to cement it. I know from my own Shia friends that they are over the moon about this trip. The fact that he's meeting Sistani, the fact that he's going to Najaf, the holy city, the fact that he's going to a Shia majority country counts enormously. And, and, and there is a real palpable sense of excitement amongst the Shia that these two great men are going to meet. This is how they're expressing themselves. So I would, I would hope that it, it buoys up um, Christian-Muslim dialogue, because that's my field. I mean, my whole life is that. But I also hope that it would embrace the Christians there who are battered and bruised and, and lift them up a little bit. Um, we all get a little battered through life and bruised and we need someone come, to come along sometimes and just pick us up and dust us off. And I hope that it will give them fresh hope that cohabitation with people of other religion is possible. It is possible to live reverently before the religion of another without fear. It is possible to live in harmony with your neighbour 
um, and that somebody has spoken not just to us but on our behalf, somebody important, I, I would hope that's the great hope that I have. Chris, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for everything that you've shared. Um, let's pray for Pope Francis as we go on this visit. And thank you for joining us to our listeners here on Behind the Story. For more videos like this, subscribe to America's YouTube channel. You can also follow the Pope's trip to Iraq on an especially dedicated section of the America Magazine website. Visit americamagazine.org slash Iraq 2021. Thank you.